there was a commercial line where there was the, the, the tagline was, where's the beef? Well, we're getting ready to see more than the beef. We're getting ready to get the full steak. Uh, it's great to have our leaders here supporting the, the conference and, uh, you know, just standing behind this vision of what this can be and their investment in you as uh, conference participants. Uh, Chris, we've, uh, we've had all kinds of uh, comments about your background and your history. I, I would just say this, that um, in preparing for today's uh, program, I had the privilege of going through a, a, a cross-section of their, this firm's amazing work, and it's truly incredible. They have a social consciousness and a, um, a commitment to quality of life issues that permeate everything, every physical solution they come up with has a common thread that is just quite amazing. So uh, I'd like for you to now welcome Chris Mulder to the stage and hear from his team. Howdy. Howdy. It's an honor to be back here today. It's great to be back here. It's great to meet old friends and I hope you understand my accent. Um, every time I get back here, I think of the first week I was hired as a PhD student uh, to work for Dr. Arlo Landfair. And Arlo always wore cowboy boots and a belt and a mug of coffee in his hand. And the first class I had to teach with him or sit with him, he walked in front of me and he walked into class and he sat on the table with his feet dangling. And he said, well, class, this is Chris Mulder. You all get a kick out of the way he talks. <laughs> so <laughs> I hope you understand us. Uh, we're coming from a different part of the world. Uh, our challenges are different. Our projects are different. Uh, the, yeah, and uh, I think if you understand that, we drive on the wrong side of the road. Uh, the climate is different, and uh, so our projects are invariably different. Um, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad that Don Austin and Mike Murphy, Don was my chair. Mike was our friend, long-term friend. I've known them for since 1978 when I arrived here, and uh, we've been friends and comrades and since, and also I see Dr. Ed Price here, who I worked with for 20 years, and a lot of other people that I've known for a long time. And also the alum students and interns that we've had in our firm over the last years. I'm great to see them again. I'm happy to see them again. I'm happy to spend time with them, especially this afternoon at the Dixie Chicken. Um, uh, but in any case, guys, thank you very much. Thanks for welcoming us. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. And of course, to Jeffrey Booth, who's done all the work and prepared everything. We were, we were straight jacketed into a very slick business procedure here. And I love it. I think it was great. The fortunate thing about this is we have all the electronic media today. I told yesterday somebody when I applied, it took me a year to complete it, because I had to write an email letter, another email, an airmail letter, posted, took three weeks to get here, the turnaround time was about three weeks, and then three weeks for the letter to get back. Then I had a couple of questions, and it's another three weeks, and another two weeks turnaround time, and another thing, until I eventually got admitted. Thank God I was admitted. It was a life-changing experience for me and my family. Absolute life-changing experience. And I'm thankful for that. We've structured our presentation internally so that I would like to introduce Jeff Brown, uh, one of our new directors at CMAI. Jeff's got his business card, the world is changing, and I'm on the transition team. And then Leon, a young architect that started working for us, award-winning architect, and my granddaughter, Marisha, my wife actually apologized, she couldn't be here, she's got problems with her foot and um, business issues that keeps her very busy at home and uh, she apologizes. She graduated with me 
1980, and we started the company uh, when we went back immediately, CMAI. And 37 years later, we're still going at it. Although, um, I had a rule, I made a rule in 1980, you, you come into CMAI butt naked, and you go out butt naked. And I'm close to getting butt naked. <laughs> 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 so, uh, with that, I will hand over to Jeff, who will start the introduction, start the presentation, and we'll rotate as we go. Thank you. Jeff. Well, in the spirit of Chris's um, um, difficult language to understand, I'm going to greet you in Goeiemore. Uh, Ninjani, Molweni. Oh, I just see some dumbfounded here. So, uh, you know, our country has 11 official languages, and uh, sometimes when you address an auspicious audience like this, it's normally um, culturally uh, respectful to greet your audience in all the official languages um, to show you know, not just respect, but deference to um, appreciating a great uh, audience here. Um, it's an extremely wonderful and exciting opportunity for me to be here and to be my singular responsibility for and, and commitment to being here at a and and in Texas at the moment is to support my friend, partner, mentor, um, whiskey drinking partner, um, it's, my, it's my singular commitment to support Dr. Chris Mulder, or as I call him, Doc, in consolidating his tremendous uh, legacy and his tremendous contribution that he made to the architectural uh, landscape and urban design landscape in, in South Africa. And hopefully over the next uh, year or two, it will be in sub-Sahara Africa because we're venturing into that part of the world. So. Um, I joined, um, with excitement, I joined CMAI, an amazing company located in an amazing town, Neisner. Um, and my wife was excited when I told her that, you know, I think I'm going to become a partner in this business. And what is exciting about it is because when I was a young man, and if you know a little bit about South African history, you can understand what I'm about to say. I grew up in an informal shack dwelling. Um, and today, I'm a proud partner in a modern, high-tech, uh, innovative, um, thought leader, uh, architectural uh, organization that designs better places for people to live. Whether you are poor, or whether you are super wealthy, or whether you spend most of your time in your, in your workplace. And that is what CMAI is about, and that is what attracts me. And I want to introduce you a little bit to our company, uh, a company that creates better places for people to live. Um, we are four very energized directors who run this company. We all are our equity partners. Uh, Chris and Steph, uh, who as a young man came here uh, with Chris in the 70s, um, and pulled the fire alarm, and everybody went crazy. Um, and Eugene and myself are the equity partners in this business, and we are a formidable team. We fight and laugh and cry and punch, but we achieve formidable results, uh, as you will see later on. And in the South African context, it is, uh, it is just uh, something amazing. Young, ener energetic, energized, and very experienced, um, group of uh, architects and urban designers and landscape designers who work for us and work with us. We are joined now in the next week or so. We are joined by Professor Ora Joubert, who is uh, a re young retired uh, head of the architectural school in Pretoria University and uh, Free State University. So Ora Joubert will uh, increase the academic <coughs> and thought leadership stature uh, of our business. Uh, in the South African context and in the region where we live, 
having a, 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 a firm like this and with a size like this, we are corporates <laughs> um, in, our, in our context. Um, you know, people look at us and they think we are big conglomerates <laughs> in Neisner. You know, we live in a town with 70,000 uh, uh, people. So CMAI is all about contributing socially and economically. It's all about uh, contributing uh, to enhance people's um, life quality. It's all about um, valuing the, the creative contribution of other individuals, not just in the firm, but outside the firm. We always seek associates and relationships and alliances that will enhance the quality of our products. And this is, um, and if you know Chris Mulder, um, this, uh, the firm is all about pro production and hard work and there's a tremendous uh, work ethic that is sometimes in the South African context um, not very uh, usual. What do we do as a, as a firm, um, and again, um, in, a, in a small region like ours, um, to, to do all the stuff that we do, master planning, urban design, architecture, landscape, project coordination, property development. Um, I mean, to name a few things, uh, we're not even sharing it in our, in our slide here, but we did the master plan for the upgrade of the Union Building, which is the seat of the head of state of our country, uh, the master plan of one of the most prestigious um, uh, botanical gardens, Kirstenbosch, in, in the beautiful Cape Town. We did the master plan for that. We did the master plan for Krutuskir uh, Hospital, which is one of the biggest public hospitals in the country. And one of the flagship involvements were our contribution in design and project management of the South African, the modern South African Central Bank um, in, in the national capital. So this, this is what um, Chris Mulder built, and this is what we are introducing today um, and just to end off, before I introduce back to Chris, this, we came a long way to get to uh, Texas A&M. Um, we live 100 uh, or 70 kilometers south uh, or further north of, of George. Uh, but, so it's an hour's drive from us to the airport. And we all got on to the airport and we flew to Dubai and then to uh, New York and then to Dallas. And we, all of us had some interesting experience at Dallas Airport. Um, some um, expletives we used against the uh, 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 Homeland <coughs> Security guys there. And <laughs> in a language that he didn't understand, but he could feel the punch. Um, and eventually we ended up uh, at uh, Texas A&M. It's, it's a great, I will speak again a bit later on some of the other projects that I'm particularly involved in, but it's uh, not just an honor, but it's, I'm excited to introduce Dr. Chris Mulder, who's become a friend, and in the absence of having a father and mother, who's become a kind of a father figure also in my life. So I'm really excited that um, I'm here to support him and to be led by him, and to... Uh, allow him to impart some of his experience and knowledge and wisdom to what I can see is a, is a receptive audience. So, Chris. I'm going to start off just uh, introducing a bit of what our landscape looks like in, in the place we stay. It's often uh, been asked, the top slide is a Google photograph, and the bottom one is an oblique photograph. We, 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 Nasna is known for the heads, the two heads, the eastern heads and the western heads, as you see there. Uh, and then the, and the ocean, the Indian Ocean, warm current, no frost, never colder than 6 degrees centigrade. Average temperature is 22 Celsius, 72, 73 Fahrenheit, so it's in the human comfort zone most of the time. Um, we have no central heating, no central air conditioning. It's not necessary. If you plan correctly and you orientate correctly, you can get by. Um, 
I'm not going to talk about the drought in Cape Town. Uh, we're fortunately not in that position, uh, but it's dry. Uh, and uh, the country is dry in the southern part, especially. So we, we're, the southern tip of Africa is Mediterranean climate. And then us, we get rain all the year round. And then as you go up higher, it's uh, summer rainfall, winter dry. And the Cape Town is winter rainfall, and the summer's dry. So uh, with, with that, we're going to move. I actually want to move on. That's the Naisna Lagoon. It's one of the most sensitive estuaries in the country. We're sitting in the middle of a national park. The town is in the middle of a national park. And the lagoon is a very special place, very sensitive ecosystem. And it took us seven years to get that project approved. Uh, that's Thiessen Island as it is today. Uh, 14 years later, 15 years later, uh, we started that. Uh, we built the canals, we built the houses, we regulated the town, we regulated the building, we regulated the colors. Not in, not in a bad way, but I think in a good way. And today it's, it's a blue flag marina. Uh, we've raised the level of the island from 1,2 meters to almost 3 meters above sea level. And the only way we could do that was to design canals, dig out the land in the canal, put it on the islands, and raise the level of the island. That was a given. We had to do it. Uh, it was a requirement. So we had to either build the houses on stilts or lift the island. We're not allowed to take fill or sand or gravel onto the island. We were not allowed to take anything off the island. Um, and that at least today, uh, we have several projects in Naisna. At the back there, where Michael Murphy worked on it, was. Uh, oops. Did I stop it now, Leon? I'm sorry. Uh, I'll keep my fingers off this thing. Uh, uh, Michael Murphy worked in our office, first of all, Don and worked there as well. They were both professors of mine. And I've lured them to South Africa later on, and they both worked there. They worked, both worked on most of the, on these projects especially. There's Belvedere in the back. It's the first project we did. Then we did the Bazula Golf Estate. And then we started Thiessen Island, uh, which was an award-winning project, a uh, multi-award-winning project. And then the fire hit us in 2015. I was here June 2015. We left. College Station, flew to New York, and as we were ready to board the plane on the 6th of June, my son phoned me and says, Dad, the office is burning. In fact, the office totally burned out. Am I on or not? Yes. The office totally burned out. Everything, we lost everything. Not even a paper clip stayed. Fortunately, we had some off-site service and we, we managed to s save all the drawings or most of the drawings on most of the projects. Some we lost, but the hard copies, the awards, the stuff on the wall uh, is all gone. And I must say within a week, Dean Venegas and the university replaced everything on the award side and the pictures and so on. We're still getting pictures this week that I've missed. And the fire, but it was a, a devastating blow to us. And uh, it took us 18 months to rebuild and work out the insurance and carry on. And today we're in a new office in another place, very exciting historical building that we've uh, adaptive reuse and put it back to use again. And uh, we all work in that area. I've now moved back to the place that burned out at Max and Robert and Chad and all those guys know I'm back. We're uh, next to Ilda Pan, the restaurant. My daughter runs a restaurant there. It's nice and easy. I can order coffee and cappuccinos and everything within 10, 15 meters. And I enjoy the walk between the two offices, which is about 300 yards apart. But the, the team works there. Batman has even painted on the wall. <laughs> and. Uh, yeah, it's an exciting space, an exciting office. We're on the water, on the, on the, on the, in the estuary, on an island. And what better place to work in an environment like that? Uh, then we were just rebuilt the, the building and we moved into the new buildings in December 2016, January 2017, and we were six months in the building and a devastating fire hit the town. 
480 official homes and about another two, three hundred dwellings were destroyed. The old town was devastated. Both axes from the north and the south were on fire. People couldn't leave, people couldn't get out of the island. People drove on to Thiessen Island, which was surrounded by water. They evacuated all the homes. People slept in the parking lot, slept on the office floor, so slept on the restaurant floors. Uh, and uh, the rebuilding process is now underway. We thought that we would, out of that adversity, we would get a lot of work. But being in a natural park, in, in a natural forest, and all green, I think a lot of people never thought about insuring. So 20%, 25% of the people were uninsured, 25% were underinsured, and uh, it left a whole gap in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the in the job market. It was devastating. It still is. But after six months, the uh, the rains came, or with the rains came very quickly, and the growth, regrowth started, and the mountains and the valleys are green again, but the trees, most of the trees are gone, uh, and uh, yeah, the, the rebuild is starting slowly. There's all kinds of specialists coming into town and giving advice. We tried to give, but we, we withdrew, but there's a lot of other people from out of town. You know, the consultant, the definition of a consultant is a guy or a lady with a briefcase in her hand that comes from out of town. <laughs> so uh, there's a lot of those. There's a lot of those in town. And uh, we're carrying on with our work. Uh, we, we entered into a competition. Uh, just, I'm not going to dwell on this, but uh, the International Institute of Landscape Architects sent out the world competition in different categories. One category is biodiversity and sustainability. And I want to talk about the sustainability <coughs> issues on this island. Uh, yeah. uh, that was the island 1933, 1947, 1990, 1998. We got the entitlements, environmental entitlements. We started digging canals. 2001, 2003, 2007, it was done. It took us seven years to get the entitlements, seven years to sell and build it out. We built 100 houses a year, 1,800 people on site. We designed everything labor intensively. That's a big difference in what you get here. We tried to design everything as labor intensive as possible to get the most jobs, and we succeeded. So we built the place based on this analysis that we're all aware of and all understand. Uh, and then we overlaid that and we developed 25 concepts until we found the one that was most beneficial, most economical, a good yield, but also environmental value and the stuff that Jeffrey talks about, social value, environmental value, economic value, and spiritual value. And the spiritual value is only coming out now. Basically, if you look at that, and you look at the canals, and you look at the people, the environmental value is there. We decontaminated 8 to 10 hectares at 16 acres. There was a lumber mill on that factory site for 100 years. Uh, womanized pine, copper, chrome, arsenic, the pollution. And we took it all out. We uh, developed the system, as you can see on the top um, there. Uh, we dug a trench on both sides, five meters deep, to hit impenetrable sand. Uh, put a, a, a bentonite wall on there and put the contaminated soil in that bentonite and then we capped it like an inverted sugar bowl. So the contaminated land was, was, was buried in, in a huge coffin of bentonite and then we covered it with topsoil and then we replanted the area. It was all saline soils, all sandy soils, nothing could grow in it. We, we had a big chipping machines there to chip all the lump. And, and yesterday, it's a bird pond, the birds are in their thousands, there were no birds before. Then. Once we had the island done, there was not a tree on that side, because we dug up the canals, filled the islands, and then spread the topsoil, put the chips back, and then started planting the trees in saline, super saturated saline soils. And yeah, that's the process how we dug it, the unique process. We, we dewatered the area where we want to dig the canals, 
and then back, back the canals and built the, 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 the Gavian walls. Uh, I think the next slide will show the, the Gavian construction, labor intensive design. We designed every single rock on that 11 and a half kilometers of island walls back by hand. It was a requirement. And, and we created a multitude of jobs, skills training, job training. And, and, and uh, then we planted the wetlands back with the help of university specialists. We planted the wetlands, supratidal wetlands, intertidal wetlands. We planted it all. And the most important thing is we raised the island at the bottom level there, 1,5 meters. That was the island level. We raised it up to 2,2 meters with a soil that we dug out of the canals and dumped on that side. And the canal had a sacrificial mattress at the bottom, Gavian walls, the Gavian mattress, and we planted on that. It was all done, and we thought, fine, that's working well. But now I want to come to the actual story. Uh, the, me, I want to get some water. The Naisna Seahorse, that little, where was it now? The, 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 the creature there, is an endangered, a critically endangered species. And it, it took us years of study to get the environmental entitlements because of the Naisna Seahorse. And people, PhD students, predicted that uh, we would absolutely ruin the seahorse life and the boat propellers and the canals would make seahorse soup. But we got the entitlements and we built it and uh, we just carried on with our work and, and now uh, two PhD students just completed the thesis. And they did studies on the sea horse, and that's actually what I want to speak about. The habitat that we've created, unknowingly, I wish I could say we designed it, but we did for that purpose. The sea horses thrive on those mattresses. It's a, it's a woven wire basket filled with rocks, and the sea horse got a curly little tail, and it looks its tail around the wire mattress, and they all sit there with their tails hooked on the wire and felt the feet. And it's immediate, it's a fantastic habitat, proven now, beyond whatever. So we're very happy that we could create that biodiversity and that sustainability for the sea horse. On top of it, we created uh, 22 hectares, 25 hectares of additional water uh, on, the, on the estuary. Instead of taking away land, we created more land. Uh, and we created more wetland, and we created more marine space. The other in, in, interesting thing for people who ever work on marine environments, if you look at that gabia, we had a choice. We had to make a choice. We could either put a, a concrete wall there, a concrete path, that was one way of creating canal edges, or we could use treated poles and put it in there, and drill it in there, and jet it in there, or we could use these wire baskets. And I decided we wanted to go for the basket because it's more flexible and, it, and it's more natural and it creates work. But what we didn't know that if you take those rocks, every single rock, and the surface area of one rock and the surface area of that rock and the surface area of that rock and all the rocks together, the surface area, if you could unwrap a rock and get it flat on the, if you take a piece of this and you fold it together in a rock, this is the surface area for marine organisms to latch onto. And there's thousands of marine organisms getting into the rock, cementing the rock, barnacles, mussels, oysters, growing there. And it was, it was now also proven as such a fantastic marine environment to have those rocks there. So it's another advantage, and that's why we entered this thing in terms of sustainability and biodiversity. Also, the contam we decontaminated the land, sustainable, uh, we planted we all, uh, we harvest all the rainwater. There's not a single storm water. We don't ever use storm water pipes in most of our developments. We all use swales, drainage, catchment areas, retention ponds, and things like that. But uh, there we did it too. You will see in the streets, if we go to the street scenes, uh, and the bird, and the bird park, uh, where it was a contaminated site, we decontaminated that area put a blanket in there, filled it with water the day as a bird pond. And the other thing is that all our street lights and all our projects, street furniture, is labor-intensive design. We design it ourselves. 
It's a hell of a job to design a street light. It's a, it's, a, it's a hassle. But if you think about that, and you can, on Crossways, the project we get to now, and this year, with this, this local artisans and nice now, it's a timber town, it's a log town, it's a timber industry, there's a multitude of good artisans there, and we design these street lights. Instead of taking a catalog from America or Italy or Spain and saying, hmm, I'd like that one, let's order 400 of those. We had it all made. And different contractors were busy. One contractor just made the steel wrapping there and the steel footing. One contractor made the wooden area, and one contractor made the concrete footing down below. So to, to, to get the street lights in town, we, we generated work for three little subcontractors who then drove pickup trucks with their names on it. They're a light manufacturer, and they're creating work. The only thing we bought was that light fitting. And the only thing we did there, there's a water fountain, we did it there. There's the street furniture, the benches. We all designed it. We could have ordered out of a catalog street benches and street furniture. But living in a country where job creation is important, we just, and we do it through all the projects, we design it ourselves. We're not making money on that design. But to create jobs, to create the extensions and the extended jobs, then the guys have to paint it. And we said, we're going to paint all the wood. Now every seven years it has to be repainted. And we trained all the people in, in painting. We had the painting companies coming to the to our office in the back of the office in the storerooms and the, the, the teach people how do you paint wood, how do you paint steel, how do you paint aluminum, what do you do? And every time they went through a course, they got a star on their overall. And those guys work now seven, eight years later. They still wear those overalls and they've been trained to paint the houses. All the houses are painted. So every seven years they repaint them. So that's a continuation on the job situation. In Crossways, that's the rural new town that we've created, the first rural new town in the country. Now, what is a rural new town? It's exactly what I'm saying. It's a new town in rural South Africa. There's no municipal authority. There's no regional authority. There's no utility supply company. And I, and I said, after Teeson Island, what can I do now that, that help the country? And, I, and I've, I've had five pillars. Food security, which is a world priority. Rural development is a national priority. Job creation is a national priority. Poverty alleviation is a national priority. And training is a national priority. And then I started looking for a piece of land where I could impose those five pillars. I failed three times in the state where we live in. The government wouldn't allow it. said, you're crazy. You can't do it. Where are you going to get water and sewer? I said, we'll get it ourselves. No, 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 you can't do it. So I went across the state line or the provincial line to the eastern Cape, went to the authorities, and I said, I want to do this. So it's a, it's a magnificent agricultural area. It's in the heart of the highest milk production area in the country and beef production. There's a rural town there that settled there in 1974. 3,000 people in the middle of nowhere, got no jobs. So we interviewed them and we sat there. And, I, and yesterday I spoke to some of the classes. Community participation, to find out what the community wants, is very different what you think the community wants. But you think and other people think, people see things differently. And we sat with the community, we sat with the tribal chiefs, we sat with them and asked them what's important, and we developed this master plan in conjunction with those. In fact, that we will provide our own water, we will provide our own sewer, and we will provide our own electricity. Rainwater harvesting is mandatory. Uh, it's a double feedback into electricity. You've got to have solar power, mandatory solar heating, solar panels. You can generate electricity if you want to through the reverse meters. You can feed into the local grid. We built our own sewer farm. And then there's I always said this, when people come to buy and look at the land, said, you know, we've got 400 club members. I said, really? So quickly? What kind of club members? I said, no, we've 400 club members, they're black and white, they've got four legs, they mow the lawns for free, and they fertilize the lawns for free. 
that's integral. The whole 400 herd cattle herd is integral into the into the design into the master plan, and uh, uh, we use circulation pathways for the cows. They move to the they go to the clubhouse twice a day, in the morning in the afternoon to drop milk, the milking powder. That's the clubhouse. The club members go to the milking powder. And they've got their own pathways, they meander through the village. There's vehicle circulation and there's pedestrian circulation. And that's how it works. It's a, it's a rural new town in the rural area of South Africa. <coughs> no municipality. Sometimes I wake up at night and I wonder how, you know, how, <laughs> how did I convince the authorities to accept that? But now it's done. And, and, the, and, the, and the principle is laid down. Uh, it's a lean and mean management system. The homeowners association manages the town. They've got money in the bank through the monthly levies. And they run the town seamlessly. We've created, uh, uh, yeah, that's a very important uh, house there. It's uh, totally off the grid, and 10 million in the house. They don't even want our sewer. It's there, but they don't want. They've got digesters creating methane gas in the kitchen. They harvest rainwater. They have solar panels on the roof. They export electricity into the grid from their roof. That's the end of the upper end of the sky. And then there's small houses on the other end of the sky. Houses on 7.3 meters wide and 250 square meters, or 2,500 square feet plot. Uh, under square meters is a thousand square foot house, uh, but well designed, well organized. We plant fruit trees on the streets. The regulation plan that you see on the right there, that's how we regulate the town. You can't just let the town happen. You can't just sell stands. You can't just sell lots. You've got to regulate and design the town that on that m image there on the left. You've got to have the third dimension fully worked out. You've got to see what it's working. In that case, it's a castle. We call it the castle. Every person builds his, his part of the castle wall from there to there, or from there to there. This guy builds from there to there. This guy builds from there to there. And collectively, the 60 owners build the castle wall around. And they live with enclosed courtyards in the center, fruit trees there, the castle green where kids can play, and fruit trees there, fruit trees here. And that's how the regulation plan works. Every single stand has a regulation plan. Where you can park your car, where you have a garage, where you have your building, where you can have single story, where you can have double story. It's all worked out. So when you buy, you, you sign the sale agreement, the, the, the deed of sale, you sign the regulation plan, you sign the constitution of the homeowners association, you sign the master regulating plan, and you sign the urban regulations, and you sign the design guidelines. So basically then, that was the puzzle. Go back to that previous slide. That's the puzzle. And we throw all those plans like in a proverbial bag. And you put your hand in the bag and you pull out this piece of puzzle and we tell you how it fits there. And that's what you can do. You have the choice internally how you want your house, as long as you stick to the size, how big, how many bedrooms, whatever. You can't build a big house on a small plot. You want to build a big house, you buy a big plot. You know that up front. <coughs> So the, we have a range of economic sector in that town, from very small to multi-million houses on the big part, and then even two acre little small farms as well. But that regulation plan and the master plan and the urban regulations is the essence of regulating and building a new town. Well, uh, there are no municipal bylaws, remember that. We have to submit our plans to the municipality as a token of goodwill, or whatever, but we control it, the homeowners control it. There's a designer review panel. Everybody that submit plans come to the designer review panel, they sign it off. Once the designer review panel sign it off, the city is happy. These guys control themselves. They won't let anything happen that's untoward or unnecessary. So that's very that's the essence of most of the work that we do is the regulating plans, the master plans, that and again, there's a lot of alien vegetation on the site, mostly gum trees from Australia. Uh, and uh, there's a whole, lot, a whole lot of people in the village, 3,000 people had skills. So we designed the street lights. We said they can harvest the wood on the, on the farm, 
cut the wood, dry it, mill, do the street lights, tall ones for street lights, the bar lights, everything. And then we just brought in a roof in the guidelines. Every fence, all the fences has to be stone, brick, or wood, gum trees, laths. So there are contractors, guys harvesting the wood, selling it to the contractors, building it. All the roads are paved bricks, labor intensive design, stormwater channels. Uh, and uh, that's how we did it. And it, 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 the government liked it so much. There's the Minister of Rural Development looking at a cow made out of black beads and wire, sits in front of the soil center. That uh, he said to me, Chris, how fast can you replicate this model? for rural development. I said, of course, it's not easy. You could, in, this, in this case, you know, when you live in an area where the cows are walking, there's fiber optic to the home, it's safe, it's security, fiber to the home. So you've got all the modern infrastructure that you would have in town, but you live in a rural area, a contemporary rural area, fiber optics, internet, everything there. Uh, and cows, and the people like, they like to see the cows sit on their porch and look at the cows in the field. And with, with, with beef cattle, it would be the same. I would guess with sheep and goats, it would be the same. With fruit trees, you can still manage it, but it's getting, it's going to get boring when you get to corn and maize and wheat. So, uh, 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 so we are looking at, at other options like this with maybe beef cattle or sheep and goats or fruit trees, where, where it's a bit more exciting. Uh, and that's the challenge, to get <coughs> the people in, in South Africa, people flock to the cities because that's where the jobs are. And we have a thing called an urban edge. And if you don't stick to the urban edge, you're not allowed. So people sit there hovering on the side of the cities, living in slum areas, and I've got this thing, let's go back to the rural and draw the people and create the work in the rural areas. There's a guy who made the cow. Uh, I caught him on George Airport. He was sitting on the sidewalk with small little wire animals like this. And I stopped by and said, can you make a big one? She said, yeah, I can make one like this. I said, no, a big one. And they said, ha, 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 you're joking. And I said, I'm not joking. Uh, so this guy made this full scale. It was a champion cow. We had a picture. I put measurements to the cow on a photograph. I gave him the measurements and he made that model. Uh, the rock, the, all the rock come from the site, all the gravel from the road gravel. We've identified through the soil analysis is a good piece site for gravel. We applied for a quarry, we developed the quarry, and in the end it's going to be a sports field. We take out sports field. So yeah, there's the, our club members. We have chickens, we have fruit. In terms of food security, it's wonderful. Climate is great. And our wetland. We have our own wetland, we have our own sewer plants, and the wetlands have been planted. We reuse the water for irrigation in agriculture. Uh, and we've been written up in various magazines, quite nice. Uh, and those are the two most flagship stuff that I wanted to show you. I would like to get Leon. Um, he won an award for this project, and I think the students would be interested in that. It was also about sustainability, readaptive use of an, uh, an existing facility. So Leon, over to you. Thanks, Chris. Um, so this is the Lafarge Wholesome Sustainability um, International Awards. Um, part of the project was, or the main purpose of the project rather, was to um, almost make the project, make a good contribution, valuable contribution to a discussion which is currently in architecture and urban design regarding um, the perception and reconceptualization of um, these derelict uh, developments in between um, urban landscapes and really what these um, derelict sites, what the impact is on the ecological systems. So the project or the site that I was most interested in is located in um, Happy Valley, which forms part of the various valley systems located in Port Elizabeth in the Eastern Cape of South Africa. Um, if you can see, there's about eight of these ecological valleys right through the city. Most of the water runs through it and then out into the ocean, but it's mostly contaminated and polluted due to the derelict state um, of 
these uh, valley systems. So the one that I was more particularly interested in is this uh, smaller valley, which is part of the CBD area. And currently there is an existing football stadium in it, um, which hasn't been used for about 30 years now. So that is the current state of what the stadium looks like. Um, it became really um, unsafe, high crime in that area. And due to the pollution that people stay there and they base litter everywhere, so it's got a very destructive nature on the ecological system. So if you look at the site, that's the existing stadium and what all the opportunities, or if you've ever seen them as constraints that turn out into real good opportunities, is that you've got a waterway running underground here, it ends up in a dam and that thing goes out to the ocean. The problem here is there's a graveyard, so most of the body fluids from the um, bodies actually end up in the water, which creates um, nickel, copper and zinc which ends up in this um, dam here, and that has polluted that dam completely. Um, it's also, if you consume that amount of nickel, copper, or zinc, it's obviously poisonous to yourself and to animals, and that runs out into the ocean where a lot of people swim. So the other problem was in this area here, there's um, polluted stormwater, and that kind of it has no root to go, so it all damps up there, which has caused invasive plants to grow. So whenever it rains, this whole area floods. So if you look at this whole context, pretty much the stadium sits as a hindrance to um, these hydrological systems. So what I looked at is firstly identifying, um, obviously you've got these fragmented hydrological structures within the valley, and potentially how do you reconnect um, all of these systems again. Um, that was the final proposal, so I kind of thought, oh, well, if the stadium is there, just use it to collect the water um, and treat it. And due to the type of uh, graphical nature of the stadium and being um, built almost in the valley, it kind of was perfect to collect the water. So end up with a proposal similar to this. Um, the water is still getting in here from the um, graveyard, but now it stops here and it gets pumped to the stadium where it goes through a system of tanks which ends up in a wetland and you've got all the water from the stormwater that also ends up in this wetland. Um, as the water goes through, it gets, um, the canal gets stronger, so it generates hydroelectricity at that point, and then it ends up in a big water lily pond. So the main idea for the water lily pond is water lilies are ideal to soak up these nickel, copper, and zinc. And the whole idea is after a 15-day cycle, um, people would actually harvest all these water lilies. They would go into a system where um, that's an algae pond, where they grow algae as the water goes through it. And they use the algae to leach off from these water lilies. And they actually extract all the metal from the water, which then goes onto an on-site jewelry studio. So the local people are taught craft in jewelry, and they can make it pretty much for free that's in the water. So at that point, the lilies are obviously dead, so they go into digestive systems, which turns it into biogas for the rest of the new proposed community. And they also clip the um, seeds, which they regrow on this side of the pavilion um, in hydroponic ponds, and that thing gets planted again to start the cycle. As the water goes through, it ends up in this area here, which is a public swimming pool. So the public park here, you enter into the exhibition space, um, and then you can get a ticket to go swim within this natural um, pool, and that then obviously goes through where it becomes now part of the new meandering river with new um, recreational activities. So at the top, it's just a plan pretty much showing what this new water system would do going through the um, stadium, and this at the bottom is a section of what the harvesting um, activities would look like. So there at the top, that is the visualization of what the um, public swimming area can be. So this water is now clean, so you can swim in it, and to keep it clean, there's wetland plants all the way around, and the water gets pumped up to the top of the roof of the stadium where it falls down, and as it trickles over the stairs, it obviously generates oxygen into the water again. So there's a whole system of how this keeps on being clean, and at the bottom, 
this is really a section showing how all the machines and um, pretty much both, and you end up with a lady swimming in the pool. Um, and what, when I started, what I was really inspired by was parasitic architecture. So that became really the expression for this whole um, stadium uh, intervention. So the stadium was seen as the host. And as a parasite, the architecture flipped onto it and feed it off to clean and clear the water. And that is an axiometric of what these systems uh, look like and how they flip onto the existing structure. And you kind of end up with something very post-apocalyptic but um, really showing what nature would like to become again within that valley system. Um, another project I was involved in was the Bloemfontein Power Station, which is adaptive reuse of an old power station that's been turned into office block. So um, this is located in Bloemfontein, right up there in the Free State of South Africa. Um, that is the context where it's located in. So you've got high residential on this side, a bit more CBD, and then this is very industrial. So the site finds itself between a very industrial and um, commercial area, but it's been segregated by a very um, big freeway. So it cuts the power station completely off with the rest of the industrial development. So the challenge here was to how do we join these two um, land uses, and also there's a big public transport node right across from the freeway. So in that, we looked at um, how do we join these. So we proposed a um, pedestrian bridge that would fly over the highways right at the bottom. And this is pretty much the view looking towards the um, old power station. So because it's an historical building, we're very limited to what we could actually put on the exterior of the building. So in this elevation, what we pretty much proposed was um, a new entrance. We've got circulation on either side. We've opened this up. Eateries, there's a new public forecourt, which I'll show a bit later in the front here. And then we've also proposed um, offices um, at the top, which leads into function space and even a gym. Um, yeah, that's just the other elevation. Um, that's where you park in the back before you enter into the facility. And this pretty much shows um, the relationship between all of us. So you've got the public forecourt or the plaza, which then leads into the more public spaces, so um, it's for a power company called Simplex. So you go in here, you can buy electricity on top of your electricity, and then it starts to break down more towards the private parts of the building, which is the offices and function areas at the top. And that's what one of the gym areas look like. And there's also a small short video just to give you an idea of what the building looks like. Yeah, so that's the forecourt, and as you enter into the building, we've added all of that in a new addition to the building, and then on the inside, we pretty much gutted everything, and um, yeah, added escalators and circulation, uh, open plan office, so uh, it worked really well with the um, structural system of the building. Yeah, and that's the function space right at the top of the building, which is also converted 